It's time to talk the world's game from an American perspective. Presented by Three Lions Pub, you're listening to Two Up Front, where we focus on all things American soccer. From the NWSL, MLS, U.S. national teams, and all the way to the youth levels. Now in the studio, your hosts, Baxter Colburn and Simon Provan. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Two Up Front on Brews Sports, presented by Three Lines Pub. I am Baxter Colburn. And I am Simon Provan. A very good Wednesday to you, Simon Provan. Kind of dreary outside today. Very Ooh, Seattle-like. Kind of up very, there. very dreary. Not yes. a fan, personally. Cold, rainy. But we're living. We're yeah, living. It's, we're it's life. It's a good day to be yep. alive. A lot of great things to get to. We've got some incredible interviews going on the program today as well. Uh, we're going to be joined by Steph Oaks of the Houston Dash and Rose Lavelle of the Boston Breakers and the U.S. Women's National Team coming up in our second and third segments. Do not go anywhere during those interviews. They're going to be a lot of fun to get those interviews and insight from those ladies. So let's definitely stay tuned for that. Of course, a uh, reminder, you can get everything that we do here on Two Up Front, uh, not only on our website, twoupfrontsoccer.com, but, of course, on brewsportsnet.com. You can find us on our Facebook page, uh, but, of course, on the Brew Sports Facebook page as well. Yeah, you can also find us uh, on Facebook, Two Up Front, in that search bar. You can find us on Twitter as well, at Two Up Front Soccer. And, hey, that's also a great way to message us, as a few people have reached out yeah. to us, direct messaging through Twitter. Or, of course, you can email us us to upfront soccer at gmail.com all right so last night there was the opportunity for fc dallas to finally rise above simon oh. rise above they had a 2-1 aggregate lead going into the game against pachuca and then the game started and then it all fell apart well it didn't it i, I will argue with you it didn't all fall apart i would actually say fc dallas came in with a, with a plan to absorb pachuca as much as possible and we saw that but in the 38th minute Pachuca did get their goal, and you kind of always felt it was going to happen. So, of course, Pachuca then goes up 2-2 on that away goal that they scored in Frisco. Uh, but what was actually a positive about that, Baxter, is that it really forced FC Dallas to open up their game. Yeah. And, and, and they took it to Pachuca. There were actually earlier moments, too, in the game in which FC Dallas did have opportunities that they just didn't put away. And, of course, as always, it's going to come back to haunt you. And that's really what it boils down to. I mean, Pachuca outshoots FC Dallas 17 to 13 on total shots, seven on target for Pachuca, three on target for FC Dallas. One of those shots did go in. Do you think the fact that nobody for Pachuca was subbed off the field played a role into them winning last night? Uh, actually, what I think played a role in, first of all, uh, this wasn't talked about enough on the feed last night, uh, not making excuses, Pachuca was the better team last yeah. night. But their first goal was offside. It was ah, a clear offside, okay. clearly offside. Uh, so that, on the replay, I noticed that, and there were uh, quite a few people on Facebook saying, uh, hey, how about an offside call there? Uh, that was, so that was one of the reasons. Uh, another reason is uh, Pachuca was just, as I said, Baxter, they, the, they were the better team. They, they, they also came out with a game plan. They applied it to effect, which did it include a lot of flopping and getting those calls? Yes. It did. Um, but look, FC Dallas is a young team. They, they played well. Chris Seitz was a monster all the way up until the final moment of the game. Uh, Coleman gave FC Dallas a lot of hope when he got that 85th minute goal, uh, which, which did shock a lot of people. The ball was like a pin, pinball in there for a little while. Yeah. Uh, but no, ultimately, what did FC Dallas in is just that Pachuca was a better team. The thing that kills you as an MLS fan, especially if you are an FC Dallas fan, is that third and final goal of that game that Pachuca ended up getting, getting which gave them, of course, the 4-3-1 on aggregate, was Pachuca's players trying to make a cross. And miscommunication between Seitz and his, uh, and his left back. Mm. Left back kind of just lets the ball go, thinking Chris Seitz is there. Chris oh, yeah, Seitz isn't. It. Goes in the goal. But here was the most disappointing thing for me, Baxter. We're a big fan of the guy. He's been on the show, Walker Zimmerman. Yeah. He was culpable on the first two Pachuca goals. One, he loses his, on the first goal, he loses his mark, doesn't see where his player is. Guy sneaks behind him, puts it in the back of the goal. Second time, Zimmerman's just letting his guy fool around with the ball. Finally, at the last moment, tries to step up and, and create something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, block the shot. But by that point, Pachuco's already looking at, at a goal. Well, Walker Zimmerman got a yellow card in the 63rd minute as well, too. So uh, to go along with his poor performance, I mean, if you're going to let two goals in and then you go out and get yellow carded as well, obviously you're going to start, be, you're going to, start to play your game at a much more reserved angle, hence why the second goal went in in the 80th minute, if you're saying with Zimmerman playing that defense. 
yellow cards are just almost like being on four fouls in basketball. It's like you don't want to get too close or too physical because you don't want to get that final foul or that final yellow card and then be out, especially with how the referees have been against the American teams. Well, and it was odd as well. Rudy goes down with an injury in the 90th minute for an hour, not an hour, for a minute and 45 seconds. FC Dallas was trying to get a sub on the field. And, wow. and there were moments where the ref could have stopped the game for an injured player, and he didn't. And I'm talking about moments in which the ball wasn't going one way or the other. So the ref very well could have, especially in a match of that magnitude, keep, keep it a fair field as much as possible. And that's the big thing, I feel like, in all of this. I mean, we're going to continue to go back and forth about whether or not FC Dallas was the, the best shot that Major League Soccer had. I mean, yes and no, but at the same time, it's the little things. And we've even been picking on Walker Zimmerman, even outside of CCL, you know, issues that he's been having. But this, this team is so talented. But the fact that when it comes to sometimes playing against these Hispanic teams, do you think it's just because it's the whole Liga MX versus MLS storyline that some of these guys just kind of lose focus in games like this? Uh, no, I think the biggest thing, and, and this is something that, look, it's, it's on MLS. Uh, it's, it's the fact that MLS starts the knockout rounds of the Champions League during their preseason and early season, whereas the Mexican teams, the Central American teams, they're midseason form at this point. That's the biggest thing, Baxter. It's the scheduling thing. And look, I am not saying that MLS gets to use that as, as an excuse. MLS has its schedule set up the way it has it set up. You know, if you go back the other way, well, now it's going to be unfair to Liga MX. I don't know how you find Someone's that Someone's always going to be upset, I feel like. Right. Even with the change that they're making where the MLS teams and Liga MX teams get to go right into the knockout stages mm-hmm. in the next uh, tournament, you're still, you're still looking at the same time frame that these games are going to be played. So I don't know how much that's going to actually help MLS. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. There's not a lot of uh, things that really can use to be solved. I mean, do you somehow try to find a way to put the games in the middle of the season or at least where at least both teams have had a couple of games under their feet? I mean, Mexico starts their year at a different time just because they can have nicer weather all year long. They don't exactly. have to worry with, you know, hail and snowstorms for half the season like, you know, we have to do for the first and end, you know, beginning and the end of the MLS season. So... That was where things can get a little crazy at times. Right. Well, one thing we'll see tonight, Baxter, of course, Vancouver still in this, taking on Tigris. Uh, Vancouver setting a tweet out that it's going to be rainy, it's going to be cold, and they're keeping their roof open. Good. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see if that affects Tigris at all. My only thing is if Vancouver has not been training on artificial turf in the rain, <laughs> is it really going to play to their advantage? That's what we'll have to find out. I don't, I don't necessarily know. I mean, I've, I've played soccer in Florida during my high school years, and any time it would rain when we'd play on turf fields, guys are flying all over the place, right. and the ball is you know, skipping left and right, and you're just trying to even remotely resemble a game of soccer. It doesn't work very well, especially in artificial turf. No, and Vancouver's already down 2 nothing in this series, uh, so they have to score at least two goals. You hope they get three, right. uh, but I just, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't have much hope for the Whitecaps. No, I don't either, and Corey here on Facebook says that Europe plays in bad weather, but Corey, they actually are playing on real grass, so it's a little different when that actually soaks it up, whereas it's more of just like this wax paper on the, on the turf that they're trying to play on, so that's why the ball flies so much well, faster. And on top of that, the way, I'm going to sound like a total nerd here, and I don't mind, uh, but but also the way the Gulf Stream works, the way it pushes, I'm going to sound like a weatherman, the way it pushes up to England, I'm going to do it, Baxter. <laughs> the way it pushes up to England, <laughs> they don't have as severe weather as sure. we would in Chicago, in Toronto. I feel uh, like you need to be like standing on the monitor here. <laughs> right. and be like, Should I do that? Here, Gulf let's. Please. So, so here, over on the F side of our two up front logo, it, the, the Gulf Stream would be pushing up through here. Mm. So you're getting all this warm air. I guess this red square here would be England, perhaps? Uh, so you get all this warm air coming through. England gets cold. Does it snow once in a while? Yes. Uh, they used to postpone games because of frozen fields. Um, but, but up here in this area where we'd have Chicago, uh, Toronto would be here. Toronto, perhaps. I think, yeah. Hey, yeah. You know, even New York and, and yeah. D.C., they're going to be dealing. I mean, can you imagine playing in a foot of snow? Uh, it, it, not really. I've done it as a kid for Same training yeah. purposes, but, but certainly not, uh, not for competitive matches. Thank you. Let me, can I take a bow for that? Yeah, please, please. There you go. Getting well crazy done. here on two up front. If soccer never works for you, how is a career in meteorology, I guess. <laughs> well done, Simon. Well done. Yeah, I was thinking that the two as well, that could be the jet stream pushing everything up and then well, over, too. And then, and then you know, you think about uh, there's Mexico down there with, right. it, with that nice microphone yeah. where it's always warm and hot. It looks nice down there. I'd like to go be down by there by Mexico. I mean, they don't... So, anyways, my, my biggest point after all this tomfoolery, yeah. no offense to any toms out there, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> is that... Uh, the, the weather in Europe does not get as severe as it is over here simply because of the differences. So, yes, right. they do play in some severe weather. And, look, the MLS Cup finals the last two years have been in cold weather. Terrible weather, yeah. But, but are you, you know, 
talking about if if we're talking about moving the schedule around now you're talking about months of cold weather months of snow so how do you you know how do you make that work mls is, is here to stay but at this point i don't know if if it's sound enough that you would still have enough people coming out to those northern cities in the winter to continually support their clubs. I, I just don't know. I'm being honest about that. Yeah, that, that is definitely the big thing. I mean, that's why MLS Cup for at least a little while was at a designated spot every year. Right. It didn't matter if you had Houston and New England, I mean, or whoever, they were playing the games in these designated areas, which was why so many people were fine with that, being like, okay, good, they, we're actually going to get a good product. But then as soon as Colorado started hosting and Toronto and Columbus, it's like, okay, we really don't know what we're going to get for sort of a weather. Like, But do you pick the four or five warm cities and like only play the final in Orlando? Orlando or Houston or Dallas or LA. I mean, it's not really fair to the rest of the league if they want to host, but nobody has like a full fledged dome. Like Vancouver has BC Place, so I guess you could close the roof there and have the final there, but Toronto's wide open, the Revolution's wide open, I mean, Seattle's wide open. Right. It definitely adds a different element to the game, that's for sure. Yeah, and it's you know it's a tough thing. Look, my the club I support the most, the Timbers, they play on artificial turf and, and it frustrates me. I don't like to see finals on artificial turf. No. At all. It's and that's been an argument for such a long time. I and mean, how many times have we seen the the Instagram and the Twitter pictures of soccer players posting, you know, shots of their knees after games, being like, "This is why we need to play an artificial service or not artificial services," right. and their knees are just torn to crap. And then it's like, "What am I doing with myself?" Like, it's and never and, a good situation. And you know, the U.S. is not the only place that plays on artificial turf. Russia has plenty of, of fields, but. Uh... Look, I don't want to get a, in a comparison debate between us and Russia, so I want to stay on air and, uh, and live to see another day. <laughs> I'm sure they mean well. They're, they're good people over there. So when you, when you think about it overall, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. People are going to continue to fight back and forth about, you know, wait for, wait for climate change, wait to see, you know, will the Europeans do it? But like you said, the, the mechanics and the weather are totally different regardless of like, oh, it's cold there. But yeah, it's, they're playing on different surfaces. There's so many other things that go into it that what we don't have here in America that they do have over in England or vice versa. Right. And uh, Corey also posed the question, why don't they play on grace, grass? Well, that's, a, that's another great question. It that depends, is a phenomenal question. It depends on the stadium situation. For example, obviously the Sounders don't have much of a choice. They're basically renting – Century Link, so and that's of how the Revolution the are too, there. for the most part. When you think about it, they're using Gillette Stadium from the that's Patriots. Right. Even though supposedly, supposedly Robert Kraft is doing something with the stadium, I'll believe it when they actually have it fully built. It, it's pretty amusing when Jonathan Kraft comes out and comments about St. Louis wanting to get a really nice looking stadium, and yeah. that, and that the, St. Louis should go through if they if they're able to get the stadium. It's like, hey, Jonathan. What about Boston? Yeah, I say, what about, you know, the team? What about the team you own? Yeah, the team that's been to, like, what, four finals? It's like, come on, guys. It's frustrating. Build your own stadium. Seriously. That way it won't look as bad on TV when you have, you know, only 7,000 people in a 60,000-plus right. stadium. Right. But getting back to Corey's question, there's, it's, it's a different situation in every venue. Usually it comes down to if it's, if it's multi-use. You know, the Timbers are not the only team that play at Providence Park. There's also... Uh, uh, one of the colleges plays football out there as well, so so you're dealing with that. Of course, the weather in the Pacific Northwest it does rain a lot, uh, but we're at we're at the point, Baxter, where they have the technology to have quick drainage of fields where you could still have real grass out there. That, exactly, that is the thing. It's not like we're playing in you know we're not playing in a third world country right now, trying to figure out you know oh what's what's going on. Like we just don't have the the, the funds to make this. No, we've got some of the best in the world. Right. Yet we still decide to stick these guys in artificial turf because it's too much work sometimes to maintain a grass field. That's yeah. frustrating. So we'll, we'll, in a roundabout way, we'll see what happens with Vancouver and Tigris tonight. I don't know. Maybe Vancouver shocks the world like Montreal did. That would be great. A couple of years ago. Go Vancouver, against, honestly. Yeah. I mean, do you really think, though, that there's an there's, – what's the realism of this actually happening? Well, I, I, would say, I would say there's perhaps a 10% chance of Vancouver moving yeah. on. That is really – I mean – That's about it. I, how, remind, how did the first leg go again? 2-0. 2-0. To Tigris. Oh, that's and, right. and Tigris dominated that game. There wasn't – and there were there were a few times where Vancouver looked decent, but that was really a game dominated by by Tigris. Of course, then you have the big move with uh, Kakute Mana being yeah. traded away, so you don't Columbus. have him anymore. Um, granted, I know he was used sparingly already the way it was because of his injury issues, but I, it, it'll be interesting. It, it, may, may, maybe the trick is keeping that roof open and, and having the rain come down. That is, that is the possibility. I mean, we've seen crazier things. I mean, as we mentioned, Pachuca was down two to one. And they put three goals in. I mean, so you know, FC Dallas, you know, in that regards, understood the negative side of that. 
Who's to say Vancouver, who is now down by two goals, can't then change sure. that as a whole? Sure, they're change playing the at home. That, that's that's a that's a huge shift there. Playing exactly, at home. that is the big thing about all of this. So, Three Lions Pub in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, is just the place for me. They've got everything: great pub food, a wonderful selection of draft beers, and a brilliant atmosphere, especially during Premier League matches. Check out the Three Lions Pub menu at threelionspub.com where you can also find all their specials and the great events that take place throughout the year. Three Lions Pub, where across the pond is now across the street. Well, uh, we've got a lot of great stuff coming up here for you on the show today. Uh, Steph Oaks is going to be here with, ju- with us in just a moment, um, and we definitely want to continue to make sure that, that is, uh, that's going to be an exciting time here for us. Uh, and we do, I believe, actually have Steph Oaks on the phone uh, when we do these interviews live on the air. Sometimes we don't necessarily know if we've got the player or the media director, so let's find out. Uh, is it, do we have Steph or do we have Edgar here going on? We're both on the line. Oh, we're both on the line. Phenomenal. <laughs> Hi, Edgar and Steph. Phenomenal. Well, we'd love, to, we'd love to get the interview rolling if you guys are ready to go for us. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic. Well, joining us on the shopfootsell.com call in line now here live on Two Up Front is Steph Oaks of the Houston Dash. A very good day to you, Steph, and welcome to Two Up Front. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're excited to have you on the program today, Steph. Uh, A very happy NWSL preseason to you. Uh, How are things looking down in the great state of Texas? How's the body feeling? How's the team looking? Things are looking good. Um, We just got back from our trip to Portland and. I think it was really good for us. You know, we got some good games in and, you know, saw some stuff that we need to work on, saw some good stuff that we like. So I think overall we're in pretty good shape. Last season, uh, the Houston Dash, very underwhelming, unfortunately, based off of the production, the injuries, uh, Carly Lloyd being in and out. But still some bright spots there towards the end of the season, whether that be Kelia Ojai and the return of Morgan Bryan after the Olympics as well, too. What does this team need to do in 2017 now that all the pieces are basically going to be there uh, to start the season to, to really hit the ground running right off on opening day? Yeah, well, I think um, I think for us we have good personnel, and, you know, that's never really been the issue. I think that the team is just, you know, learning how to mesh well together and learning what works and what doesn't. And I think in the past... Um, you know, there were, you could kind of tell there were kind of some chemistry issues on the field. And, um, I think it was hard for us to get a good group going. Like last year, we had a bit of a, a rough point in the beginning of the season. And we had like a streak of games where we just could not, <laughs> could not win, could not score. And it was really frustrating. But towards, um, towards the end of the year, we kind of started getting more of a rhythm. And I think for us, you know, we have a lot of good players. It's just a matter of working well together. Steph, this is Simon. Once again, thank you for spending time with us here on the shopfutsal.com call in line on two up front. Uh, one of the questions I do have for you is Baxter had mentioned Carly Lloyd. Of course, Carly playing with Manchester city until June is the team set up a little bit better right. this year, knowing that she won't be there until June? You know, last year was a little bit of a surprise that she wasn't going to be there, of course, with her injury. This year, you know she's not going to be there. Is there you, do you feel there's more of a plan in place to deal with that? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, last year it was hard with a lot of players coming in and out, you know, not just Carly, but uh, with everyone. And, you know, it really takes, a lot to have players away from training or gone for a while and then all of a sudden they come back again and you know it definitely changes things as much as you want to say that it doesn't make a difference uh, but I think this year it'll be I don't know it'll be good and for now you know we're not really focusing on the fact that Carly's not here you know while I do wish she was here like she's a great player and a great person to be around I think you know we're just kind of dealing with what we have and trying to focus on that right now and I think when the time comes if she comes back then you know we'll work her in but for now I think we're just more focused on you know dealing with the players we have and how we want to set up that way. In your mind Steph what is a realistic finish in 2017 and this team is built on a lot of young talented players that are representing their country at the highest level as well as of course playing here in the NWSL but 
not only has Houston gone through a little bit of an ebb and flow in the offseason, there's been teams like Boston and Seattle yeah. that have been restocking. Washington yeah. basically gutted their roster and said, let's see what happens. What, what can we actually expect from the Dash in 2017 so that way fans can at least sort of start to prep themselves? I mean, obviously no one knows until the season starts, but from what you've seen on and off the field for preseason and the transactions, how are you feeling about what a realistic finish is for the team in 2017? I think realistically for us, you know, we we kept a good core of the team, which I think will honestly work to our benefit because, you know, we didn't come into preseason feeling like we had to really get to know all these new places and deal with that issue. So I think, you know, that will definitely help in our favor. And I think for us, we tried to, in the off season fill some gaps that we may have had last year. Um and just, like, shift things around a bit to get the personnel where we wanted it to be. So I think, you know, definitely in our minds, we want to be a playoff team, and that's kind of what we're shooting for this year. Um, you know, I, of course, every team says that going in, and then everyone's like, oh, we want to be the number one team. But I think for us, the main goal is just to make it to playoffs since we haven't done that yet. Um, and so I think for, for us, that's just the main goal, and that's what we're – working towards because you know I think in the past we've had the personnel to do it but it just hasn't really worked out um so hopefully this year with the changes we've made and you know just the way things have been going at training I think you know we're really focused on that and everyone is really motivated to do that of course, talking about motivation, Steph, you spent some time once again with Canberra United in the W League. How important is it for you to go on these off-season loans and, and continue to play throughout the summer? Oh, I think it's huge. You know, it's it's tough, though, because it's it's nice to have an off-season and some not play, you know, give your body that rest. But um, the way it's set up, it's kind of tough because it's such a long off-season that you know, you can only go work out on your own so much. Like, you still, you know, you miss getting those touches on the ball. You miss game play and stuff like that. So, for me, like, I love going to play in Australia. (laughs) And I think it's, I think it's really good just to get games in and, you know, keep playing because I, as I finished over there, I came back and I just felt, I felt fit, like, and I felt ready to go. And, you know, that's such a good feeling to have going into preseason instead of, you know, just coming in saying, oh, well, I've run on the treadmill all off season, you know, it's it's different. And I think it's, you know, to be able to play and do that type of stuff is is just huge. And a couple of the other girls have tried to do the same thing, and I think, uh, I think it's super beneficial. And if you, if you saw the league over there this year, it was just, like, flooded with, um, with uh, American players. <laughs> so, um I think a lot of people are catching on to that, I think, because, you know, their season really fits in perfectly with ours, and it's a really nice place to go. So, yeah, I think it's overall a pretty good experience to go there. Yeah, and of course I say summer, and uh, I meant the <laughs> winter. It's just it's rainy and dreary up here in Milwaukee, Steph. So I'm just longing for summer. So I'm going to say you're just, you're just we're getting the off season wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, Steph, looking. Um, I at... came back really tan, so that was nice. <laughs> right, exactly. That's always the best part about it. I'm, I'm from Florida, so I understand the the longingness <laughs> for the summer weather. And it is it it is summer in Australia though when you're playing there, correct? Technically, I believe that's true. Yes, yeah. Okay. It's, so it's a little were... colder when we get there, but um, it turns into summer. There you go. So you were, you were there technically, we go. There we you were go. just that thinking in Australian time, basically. That's what you were thinking of. Steph, <laughs> one of the other things I'm curious about uh, looking at this roster is the abundance of uh, midfielders and forwards on this team that are incredibly talented. However, the the crutch that has been Houston the last couple of seasons has been the inconsistencies on defense. Uh, somebody as yourself that does play defense along with some of the other talented gals on the team as well. Are, is there, has there been more conversations with Lydia Williams and now Jane Campbell coming in as well too to try to get everything kind of put together a little bit more nicely? What exactly is Houston yeah. going to do to kind of stop the, you know, pardon the bad pun, but the sieve that has been the Dash's back line, unfortunately, the last couple of seasons? Yeah. Um, I think for us, you know, we just, we really need to get like a good solid back line to kind of um, stick with it, you know. And I think that I remember like my first two years here, I, I was even playing in the back line for a while, 
and we would like shift the lineup like every single game almost and it you know it kind of just gets hard to get a rhythm and last year I thought you know that was part of the issue especially with players coming in and out from um, various national team duties and stuff um, but I think for us we just like this year we have we brought in Janine from South Africa and she is a little bit older she brings a lot of experience which will be really good and right you know, we also have Bruna from Brazil, who's also older and has great experience. And I think for us, it's going to be great. And just being in preseason so far, you know, having those types of players makes such a big difference because before it was like we would tend to have a lot of younger players. And, you know, while I'm not saying that's the worst thing in the world, but I think it definitely helps to have experience and to have, you know, like a confident voice back there who can really lead the back line. And it's, you know, I think that's something that we were lacking is that leadership back there and, you know, someone who's really going to help keep everything organized, someone who's going to help lead the people in front of them and and stuff like that. So I think I think you'll definitely see a better back line this year, I'm well, hoping. But <laughs> so far in preseason, it seems <laughs> like they've done pretty well, so... Well, that's definitely the, that's definitely what you want to hear as you move into the season is that things are starting to kind of you know repair after I mean even after last season you you finished with a with a zero goal differential thankfully with twenty nine conceded and twenty nine scored but you'd like to be on the positive side of that in twenty seventeen and I think honestly I mean Simon we've talked about this already yep. a little bit what what Houston and other teams have done I mean this is going to be a probably one of the best years of NWSL I think going forward well absolutely <laughs> and and Steph of course your home opener is is your first game of the year on. Saturday, April 15th, 2 o'clock Eastern Time, taking on the mighty Chicago Red Stars. So uh, it's, a good test. it's an ex- exciting way to start off the season, of course, against Chicago, but also at home at the beautiful BBVA Compass Stadium. Yeah. Um, I think we're, we're very excited. And it's, it's crazy how fast preseason has flown by because I feel like we just started. But, uh, you know, it was good because we got to actually play Chicago in Portland, so we kind of got a good feel for them. And I think um, going into the first game, we're just everyone's so excited. And there's so much good energy towards it, so hopefully, it will go in our favor. <laughs> well, I, by the way, uh, you got to tell Rachel Daly to calm down with those magnificent goals and preseason. She's got to <laughs> save those for the regular season, so she gets goal of the year this year. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? I, I, I was talking about Rachel's fantastic goal against the Thorns in the uh, preseason oh, tournament. Yeah. That's why she's one of the best, and we certainly love having uh, She's been on the program before as well, too. So, Steph, well, we got to run, but we appreciate you taking the time to join us here on 2 Up Front. Uh, we wish you nothing but the best uh, during the 2017 season, and I uh, hope to revisit with you as well maybe in the next couple of months as well. All right. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Thanks, All right. We'll talk to you soon. There goes Steph Oaks on the shopfutsal.com call in line. Great to hear from her. Great to get a little bit more of a, an insight into the wide world of the Houston Dash. Uh, Houston, of course, it's known by many of folk as the team that I support. Uh, it's been a love-hate relationship over the last two years, but uh, I feel like you know, Houston certainly has some of these pieces in place. You know, I wouldn't call it a love-hate relationship for you. It's more like a love-confusion relationship. It, it is, because I love them, but they confuse me because it's like, you have so many good players, why are you bad? That's what, <laughs> that's what confuses me. You know? I, I do think we're going to see, if, we've talked about this, a, a, a better dash this year. Well, I think the the big thing, too, is going to center around the the production from Kelia Ojai. Last year, she really had that coming out party towards the end of the season where she was scoring goals left and right. Now you look ahead to what she's been doing already in the off season. She's been getting consistent call-ups with the U.S. Women's National Team. Also, this is a player that knows what to do to be successful, and I think Absolutely. she's going to do that at a high level this year. So I'm yeah, looking forward to that. Continue to see her growth, which is very exciting, of course, with the Dash, and as you said, with the women's national team, and she's only getting better. Right, exactly. Speaking of the women's national team, speaking of players that are definitely on the rise, uh, in 2017, the first overall draft pick came out of the University of Wisconsin in the NWSL. It was Rose Lavelle. Uh, we had the opportunity to sit down with her a couple of days ago and have a conversation, get to know what she's been doing here in the off season, her time with the U.S. women's national team. Uh, and it's been just a, it was an absolute pleasure and, and an honor, honestly. And uh, we have the full interview here for you now. So uh, enjoy Rose Lavelle here live on Two Up Front. Hi, everybody. Welcome to a special edition of Two Up Front as we continue on with an exciting show that we've got going on for you. Uh, for those of you guys that know, we'd like to.
This is like a World Cup win for two up front It really today. is, honestly. Uh, we've got a lot of excitement to get to in just a brief moment. Uh, but as you guys know, we, we here on Two Up Front uh, love to do different interviews that we get to incorporate into our show. Uh, and as you mentioned, Simon, we've had the opportunity to interview a lot of great players, honestly. I mean, we've talked to many different players, men's and women's, uh, club, international. The list goes on and on, honestly, from as young as your daughters to as you know, right. old as gentlemen like Peter Wilt that have changed the game of soccer in the United States forever, basically. But we've got a very unique and exciting opportunity today to interview uh, Rose Lavelle from the Boston Breakers. Uh, she was the number one overall draft pick in the uh, 2017 NWSL draft. She is also uh, one of the up-and-comers as well for the U.S. Women's National Team. But more importantly, she's an alumni of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and she joins us now on the shopfutsal.com call in line. Rose, a very Good day to you. Uh, welcome to Two Up Front. How are you today? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Absolutely, Rose. We are just thrilled to have you on the show today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you are down right now uh, in the great state of Texas, getting ready for the U.S. friendlies against Russia. Uh, how are the first couple of days of camp treating you? How's the body feeling? Uh, how's the team looking so far? Well, I can tell you it's been really nice being in the warm. Boston has been pretty freezing. Um, so it's been really nice coming down here and getting away from the cold for a little bit. But um, the training's been fun. The environment's been awesome. We scrimmaged a boys' team last night, um, and it's always – they're super – obviously very athletic, super competitive, and it's always a nice test for us. So um, that was good. And now just coming in the next couple of days, I think we're just going to focus on the game plan and see where that goes, hopefully. Hopefully get some wins under our belt. <laughs> Well, Rose, you recently made your debut with the U.S. Women's National Team. Of course, you had uh, it was in a loss to England 1-0, but you were named Woman of the Match, played an incredible game, highlight reel after highlight reel for you in that game. I wonder if you could take us through what that debut was like for you. Um, well, there were definitely a lot of nerves. Um, I mean, regardless of who we were playing, there were going to be nerves, but I think especially playing a team like England who's so good and they have such great players that, made it 10 times more nerve-wracking. Um, definitely my first couple touches, I think you could tell I was nervous, but um, after the f first couple of minutes, I think I found my rhythm. When you look at the way you play the game, Rose, the first thing that I noticed, and I'm sure a lot of folks noticed, uh, maybe that weren't used to seeing you play for Wisconsin or the younger youth teams, is that the fact that you are a natural, fast player. You, you run incredibly fast on and off the ball, but you have just an incredibly talented touch as well when you actually have the ball at your feet. Some people liken it to the speed that Cristiano Ronaldo has when he runs down the wings as well, too, uh, just because of the fact that you have that breakaway speed, but also that incredible touch as well. Do you value that as the most uh, important part of your style of game, or what do you think is the most important style of uh, your game that makes you so successful? Uh, um, well, thanks. That was really complimentary, but... Um, yeah, I guess I, I like to dribble. I would consider myself more of a technical player. I think growing up I was pretty tiny, so I had to find ways that um, I could get out of situations without getting bumped off the ball, and I think that <laughs> has kind of helped me growing up and getting to this level. Hey, Rose, you're taking on Russia Thursday, April 6th, and Sunday, April 9th. Of course, the first game in Frisco down there near the Dallas area, and then uh, the second game at BBVA Stadium in Houston, which is a, a beautiful stadium. Yeah. Uh, curious if Coach has talked to you at, about, uh, talked to you at all about uh, the game plan, how she may use you. Are you going to be in both games, rest for one? Curious about your thoughts on that. Um, I have not heard, but, um, you know, whatever. Whatever the game plan is, whatever she has in mind for me, I'll be ready for it. How much does being able to play with some of the veterans on the squad, especially in that midfield and attacking forward position like you do from time to time, how, how much have you learned from some of the veterans, the household names, the Carly Lloyds, the Megan Rapinos, Alex Morgans, Crystal Dunn even? I know she's young, but she's also accomplished a lot in her early career. What, yeah. are some of the, what have been some of the big things that those ladies have shared with you to help you feel a little bit more at home at the national team and just a professional soccer player as a whole? Yeah, I mean, being able to come into so many – camps has been awesome and I've learned so much from them um a lot of it has come off the field too I think watching Carly and how professional she is she's always taking care of her body and staying on top of recovery stuff same with Allie Long and all of those guys and I think um obviously if you want to stay at this level you have to take care of your body and I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned being in in this environment and then I would say also just the competitive they bring every the competitiveness they bring every training um 
it's a whole other level here. And obviously, if you want to stay at this level, you have to come into every practice and be ready to compete and fight for a position. Um, so I think just seeing that while they train and kind of bringing that into my own game when I'm in training too, I, I've definitely taken that from them. Uh, speaking of a competitive atmosphere, you're going to be down, or you're with the Boston Breakers, as Baxter had said, number one overall draft pick in the NWSL. Boston, terribly excited to have you. I'm curious the difference between training with the national team, where you are uh, learning from those leaders around you, and then being with Boston, who had a big turnover in the off season. I, I wonder if perhaps you see yourself as a leader already with the Boston Breakers. Um. Well, they, they obviously have a lot of new players, but they still have some veteran players who um, are, are good players and great leaders. And um, I'm willing to play a leadership role on the team, but I also think there's still some um, – there are a lot of players with experience on that team who can fulfill that role too. We've had Coach uh, Matt Beard on the show before, Rose, and he, uh, when he first took the job, and he actually came on the show soon after he took the job, he was very critical of the women's college game in America, saying that it still had a long way to go. But uh, we also had him on shortly after he drafted you first overall, and I said, Coach, have you changed your mind? And he's like, well, Rose is a special player and certainly can uh, <laughs> change a person's mind about how the game is certainly developing. But this is a breakers team last year, Rose. You scored 14 total goals as a team last year, only three wins is Boston going to finally dig itself out of the depths of the NWSL? Because as well as Boston has gotten good, a lot of the rest of the teams also stocked up this offseason as well, too. So is Boston going to be able to get over some of those you know, teams like FC Kansas City that got Sidney LaRue and Amy Rodriguez back and some of those other talented clubs that were towards the bottom last year? Um, definitely. I mean, I think every team has been changing. I don't think any team is exactly how they were Um in the year past, but, um, like I said, I think Matt's brought in some great players and there's obviously a lot of good rookies too. So I think we can definitely be a force to be reckoned with this season. All right, Rose, I do have to ask you, I've got a brother who went to UW actually won a championship with the men's team back in 1995, <laughs> not to age myself at all. <laughs> I was three, uh, but you are the first number one draft pick out of all the athletes ever to go through the storied, Wisconsin sports program. I'm curious what an honor that is to you. Yeah, I, I was a little surprised when I found that out. I think obviously Wisconsin has such great athletics and has such a tradition with athletics. So I was a little surprised, but um, I, I know I won't be the last. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of great athletes that come through Wisconsin and somebody will be able to share the same honor. Well, one, one thing I do have to ask you about, Rose, we, we talked a bit off air about this, so I just want everybody to know I got the okay to ask about this. So one of the guys that I coach with over at the club that I'm at, uh, you actually roomed with his daughter, Peyton, at, uh, at UW. Yeah. And I understand that there's a unique goal celebration that they're at least pushing for you to, uh, to bring to the NWSL. I wonder if you could tell us about it. Maybe I can do the visuals for you. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how this works out. Yeah, um, it's a very Wisconsin celebration, as you'll see. The parents are really trying to push for me to uh, make this my new goal celebration. They call it Milk It, so you snack your hands together, go like this, and this is supposed to be the <laughs> this is supposed to be the cow waters, and then somebody milks the cow waters. If it makes it any consolation, we were doing it as well while yes, you were yes. doing it. So, yeah. I mean, so, so, so people didn't see. It. Yeah, uh, we got there we you got go, the udders, and yeah. then right we, there you go. There, there we go. go. The, Simon the and I just celebrated a goal on our end here. So <laughs> I think it's already catching on. I can already see people making T-shirts. I mean. I, I fully. Catchy, I feel like it is. I mean, especially. I think that would be the best to celebrate, like your first national team goal, and that people would be like, "Wait a minute, who is this girl from Wisconsin doing this utters thing?" The Russians would be like, "I'm sorry, what did you just do?" Like, I mean, that would be certainly a way to make you uh, make a statement. That's for sure, right off the bat, Rose. Uh, one of, one of the last things we need to ask you about Rose, which a lot of people are just on the edge of their seats to know, is how's your bulldog? How's Wilma? <laughs> I love when people ask me about her. I just FaceTimed her today, and she's doing really good. Um, a little hungry. She was waiting for her lunch, but she is so great. I haven't seen her in a while, so I really miss her. 
Uh, we, we have a picture up on our screen right now of, of your Bulldog. So. In, the, in the soccer jersey and the, and the red sunglasses here, just uh, an iconic picture of, of Wilma. How, how important has Wilma been to your success on the field, Rose? Ugh, she's just the best. She's, she's been some, I mean, she's a dog, so there's only so much to do. But, <laughs> but the way you, the passion you speak about her, though, it, it, you really can tell that there's a true relationship there, though. No, I mean, it's it's always so awesome whenever I have a bad day. Obviously, I don't see her as much, but whenever I have a bad day, if I, if I FaceTime her, if I go home and I get to snuggle her a little, she always cheers me up. She is just the best thing in the world. Yeah, that's that's what dogs are for. That's they exactly they, they right. don't talk back to you. They, they they sit there, they and they can sense when you're having a bad day. I've yeah, got two myself. Like, you know, they they come right up to you and snuggle with you. Very very cute dog by the way, Rose. Yes. That's the first time I've seen a picture of her. So, <laughs> adorable. Thank you so much. That is so flattering. <laughs> well, Rose, uh, this has been an absolute honor and a pleasure on our end to, to get the opportunity to catch up with you. Uh, we wish you absolutely nothing but the best, uh, not only with the national team but also with the Breakers this upcoming season as well. And uh, we look to hopefully have you back on the show here in the next couple of months and uh, wish you all the best as well too in your upcoming career as well yeah well thank you guys for so much for having me absolutely rose we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon so thank you again for joining us here on two up front today. yeah thanks rose thanks guys all right there goes rose lavelle on the shop futsal.com call in line a very special interview here on two up front uh, we like to do these here on our on our show page remember here on Wednesdays, you can catch us on Brews Sports. Uh, for those of you that are watching this here on Wednesday, we've got more of a show sticking up, uh, so hang tight. We're going to be back with more on this. Uh, he's Simon Provan. I'm Baxter Colburn. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, we'll see you guys next time on Two Up Front on Brew Sports. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. And wardrobe change. <laughs> whoosh, that's how it happens. Whoosh, whoosh. That's how fast I am. I'm that fast. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, about... I'm, I'm giving the weather report here in that whole interview in the, in the background. You, you know, were. As we were on break here. I know. I, I think that the people of England know now what to expect. <laughs> like, if you look here, Chelsea, they're going to take over the Premier League, and then Tottenham is going to fall. It's very obvious. Oh, the bringing Nor'easter. up the Premier League. Everton. <sighs> breaking my heart. Don't First of all, losing to Liverpool 3-1. to one. <laughs> Lukaku disappears in perhaps their most important game of the year. Yep. Uh, basically, Liverpool seals their fate. They're going to Europe, I think. Uh, Everton oh. probably not. They had a slim chance, uh, but then, then Everton draws with Manchester United yesterday with a 93rd minute PK goal you by can't Zlatan. Let that in. Can't let that in. So breaking my heart there. Uh, anyways, sad, anyways. Sad, sad. Well, some phenomenal interviews. Honestly, great to hear from Rose Lavelle. Just an absolute sweetheart, and I, I truly believe that she needs to do that. The the, the, <laughs> the Melkin, Melkin celebration <laughs> when she scores against Russia. I mean, I think that would be absolutely phenomenal. I think it would be even better if she like ran over to Jill Ellis and Jill Ellis would be like, "Yeah, like, I, I'd love to see what the what the, the commentators best. would be saying of what what what, what is, is going on right now. I don't know what's going on. I could see Rob Stone or Arlo White being like, "What." I mean, well, she <laughs> appears to be milking a cow. I don't know what's going on. If she was, like, super yeah. well, if it was just, like, minor league soccer, like, to have a cow, like, stationed somewhere and then, like, to run over fast, you're like, I got a cow. Like, that would be amazing. That would be the most Wisconsin thing ever. Yes. And then she would, like, put yes, a cheese on. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. And, and you Wisconsin. know what, though, too, Baxter, it was, it was great to have somebody on from the Houston Dash, but it's because it's been quite a while since a very we've long had a Dash time. player on. Of course, part of that is is – the NWSL being in their off season, but busy time. it was great to get back to having Houston represented on two yeah, up front. Absolutely. I mean, it was good to hear from Steph folks. Uh, we're, oh, we're almost done with our, our Houston dash uh, bingo card. We've gotten a vast majority yeah. of the players yeah. from them. Got to work on Carly and Morgan and a couple of those others, but uh, definitely. A lot well, of as we talk about, we, we tend to get players going on the way up. So maybe we'll get them coming on the way down at some point. Hopefully. I don't know. We'll Between see. Carly and Morgan, that would definitely be the, uh, the best thing possible yeah. if it works out. But, uh, definitely been a great show so far. Uh, remember to keep those comments coming. Hit that share button as well, too. I know people were asking some great questions earlier on. Um, and I think we've got a couple more as well, too, I wanted to reference quickly. But today has also been a huge day for women's soccer, Simon, in the sense that the CBAs for the uh, women's national team have officially been settled to an extent, I think might be the best way to say it. I mean, yeah. Yep. No, settled. That's, that's, that's the best way to say it. It's come to an agreement. Um, I, I don't know if it's officially been ratified, but U.S. soccer and the women's players uh, union basically have, have come mm -hmm. to an agreement. Uh, the court case for the gender inequality on pay is still alive and apparently well, and, and we should know the results of that 
at some point within the next six Hopefully. months, from what I understand. But but the big thing is the CBA is now behind them. Uh, greater commitment from U.S. Soccer to up mm. the standards and NWSL. Um, also a commitment, a recommitment to pay NWSL players salaries that are allocated players. But along with that, this is new, Baxter. Players are then expected to commit to the NWSL. Which I think is the absolute best thing that could possibly come out of this. I get it. Yes, of course, you want the money. You want to make sure that these ladies are well taken care of. But the fact that you just what you just said, that the players have to show that commitment to the league is crucial. No more Kelly O'Hara's leaving. No more Alex Morgan's or Carly Lloyd's. Crystal Dunn was a full transfer, so that I'm, I'm, I can't be mad about that. Right, but right. these you know, five- to six-month loan stints with a club in Europe, it's not going to happen anymore, hopefully. It doesn't sound like it, or or what it does. Maybe the unintended consequences. You have more of these players doing full seasons overseas, full season loans or full season transfers. Like just go exactly. for a, go for a season, right. and then we'll right. we'll talk to you next year. Or you finish up your contract with the NWSL, and then head over to. So so there's things in there. There's details we don't know all the stickiness about. Uh, but definitely seems to be a, a good meeting of minds. And, and there, are, there are other positive things that it's good to see that U.S. soccer did do with their final agreement. For example, uh, better conditions for women who are right. pregnant and, and still playing the game. Better conditions uh, on the road when you're playing with the U.S. women's national team. But the thing I love most hearing about is how U.S. soccer is going to focus on upping the standards for the entire NWSL mm. because that affects your superstar players, down to your developmental players on that roster. Which is ultimately the biggest thing when you, when you really break it down. So I think that this has been a win overall for the collective bargaining agreements. I mean, yes, there might be still little things that certain people will be like, well, they should have done this, they should have done that. But this is a huge step forward for everybody involved. So I think you have nothing but excitement moving forward now for not only women's soccer as a whole, but there's also women's hockey as well, too, that was actually dealing with this for a while as well. But they both have been able to ratify their issues uh, with Team USA or the U.S. Federation as a whole. And it's interesting. I was reading this from Grant Wall. The, the U.S. women's soccer team, the man that they fired uh, just a few months ago who was part of this agreement mm -hmm. or who was trying to work out a, a CBA with U.S. soccer, he's actually the gentleman responsible for getting the U.S. women's national hockey team stuff wow. done. So He's like, if you don't want me, I'll go to a different right, sport. Right. And it seemed to work out just fine for them. But, but it's, it's great to hear it's working out for everybody it, exactly that that is absolutely right about that all right uh let's move into our mls predictions here for the upcoming week of action uh they are brought to you by red lion pub here in milwaukee go check them out they're the uh, sister of three lines pub our presenting sponsor here on two up front they do phenomenal food phenomenal drinks great place to go watch a yeah. game of footy as phenomenal well. atmosphere and and don't forget you can play rooftop soccer pool yes we played we've before done. it's yes. a lot of fun you got a great view of the river down there too I exactly think. it's definitely worth the trip if you are here in the great state of wisconsin the great city of milwaukee as well all right uh predictions time predictions time well last week um our interns weren't fast enough to get us our results so we don't officially know where we stand no right but i now. think it's pretty bad for both of us last pretty week. positive yeah uh, if you look at the results from last week baxter not a single road team won which is uh, kind not of a uncanny, single home team crazy. lost. Every home team either won or drew. Insane. The only games that really stick out to me, and I, I told you this uh, a couple of days ago, I was really upset with Luis Robles and the fact right. that he just didn't feel like playing a, like playing goalie uh, against Eric Kubo Torres. And he, of course, was named Player of the Week by MLS, which is great now. But, I mean, when you score three goals that the goalie should have stopped all three times, I, in my mind, takes away from that a little bit. But Houston, a statement, another big win, 4-1 to one against the Red Bulls. Houston seems to be legit right now, Simon, and that, might, that should start to terrify some of those Western Conference teams. Well, and, and in fact, they've got a game in hand against Portland, so they could be sitting in the su Supporter Shield lead by the end of this. Well, I guess Portland plays as well. But nevertheless, they could still be sitting in the Supporter Shield uh, top of the table by right. the end of this weekend. Doesn't surprise me, Baxter. Does not surprise me. Again, I, I told people at the beginning of the season, they're my Colorado this year. Yeah, and uh, they're certainly exceeding Colorado expectations. They certainly are, and Cubo Torres himself is exceeding expectations. So was Cubo Torres really that bad of a player these last this last year, two years, whatever it's been in mm -hmm. Houston, or is it that he's finally got a coach who understands him and knows how to play him? I think it's a mixture of the coach and a mixture of the supporting cast around him. He finally has other talented players from that Central and South America region that understand the same style of play that 
Torres does, and I think that's why they've been all gelling so exceptionally well. And ultimately, that I think is why they've been so successful. Well, you know, people are still saying to me, Simon, it's early in the season. It's early in the season. You can only say that for so long, right? You know, we're, we're at what point four do you games, f- five games? At what in. point do you finally say they keep scoring three and four goals a game against good opponents? They must be good. They must be good. Luis Robles isn't some wrecked goalkeeper. He's a good goalie. A- absolutely. You know. Uh, if, now, if you're Nick Romando and you got four goals scored against you from Minnesota over the weekend, then that's a whole nother conversation. I mean, I don't want to give because we know we got to make our predictions here. But like, <laughs> come on, really, Real Salt Lake? Like, you had one job: don't lose to literally the worst team in the entire league, and you did. You let them score four goals on you. That's just and, embarrassing. And I think if I heard right, Baxter. I believe Pecky didn't coach this game yet. I think he was sitting in the stands for this one. Okay. Because I think he did. They have a manager week. at all. I, <laughs> <laughs> and I could have heard this wrong, but I think I heard another show. That's what happened. I'm okay. not going to lie to the viewers. He's probably I, I sitting there at home the going game, like, but, whoosh, but like, hey, congratulations to Minnesota United, though. First win, Christian Ramirez, still a very scary player, and Kevin Molino as well, too. So the, the pieces are there on the offensive side, but the defense still has a lot of work to go. Well, and I think that's what we saw with RSL. I mean, their, their defense was not very good in this game, obviously. Right. <laughs> Give up four goals. Terrifying. All right, prediction time. Vancouver versus Tigres tonight. Tigres got a 2-0 aggregate uh, lead going into this one. Tigres is going to take the game for me. Vancouver, I mean, yes, it's kind of like, you know, help me, Obi-Wan. You're my only hope. But it's help me, Vancouver. It's just not going to happen. I, I, here's what I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with Tigres is actually going to sit back quite a bit. I think Vancouver maybe wins the game mm. 1-0, 2-1, but they lose on aggregate. Yeah, I can see that. That makes a lot of sense. Tigres is going to score probably early, and then Vancouver is going to try to play catch-up, I think, the rest of the way. and might get a goal or two and make it interesting. Or Vancouver might score right off the bat, but then Tigres is going to finally put that final nail in the coffin somewhere in the 60 to 70th minute range, I think. Yeah, yeah I could see that. Galaxy Montreal Friday night. Uh, neither team really knows who they are. They're both a shell of themselves. Laton rumored to go to the Galaxy over the summer. Maybe. Maybe. Don't read too much into that. I don't want any of these teams to win. They're both terrible right now, but... Well, the thing for me is both of these teams are dealing with significant injuries. Robbie yeah. Rogers is still out. Sebastian Leggett is still out. Of course, on the flip side, looks like Piatti still may be out. This is a toss-up, but I, I think I'm going to give this one to L.A. just because I was uh, just about I, I to feel say, like they're due for L.A. a L.A. is probably the route I want to go as well, too, honestly, just based off of the general talent that still is hanging around, honestly. So well, L.A. for both of us. Um, all right, then you also look over uh, at the games taking place over the weekend. There's some fun ones there hanging around. Uh, Chicago, Columbus, uh, New England, Houston. Those are the first two games. Boom, boom, right off the bat there. Listen, New England, we have this conversation every week. It's just not going to happen. Yes, I'm surprised how well you did against Portland, but you're now going up against a team that arguably is even better than Portland. And you're, you know, you've had awful history against the Dynamo. I don't care if they've been a better team on paper or not. The Houston Dynamo are going to do terrible, terrible things to the Revolution defense this week. I, I, I agree with you, Baxter. I don't see New England winning this game. Their their offense is starting to click. Uh, defensively, they're doing okay, but Dynamo are so hot right now. And, and in that game that New England had against Portland, uh, you know, it took them into the 85th minute or so in order to tie things up. Yeah. Um, and they didn't have many opportunities that game. No, and the goal that Valeri scored, too, was a poor cro- was a poor clearance defensively, too. I mean, you That's don't right. head the ball back into the middle with the most dynamic player in the league sitting there being like, oh, Well, and not only you. that, I mean, granted, I love the goal, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's already a candidate for goal of the year. Do I think it'll win? No. Um, but to leave Diego Valeri all alone. Unmarked in the box. Unmarked. <laughs> That's sure a lot that's about like rule number one for playing Portland. Exactly. Don't leave Diego yes. Valeri unmarked. Makes so, sense to me. So I, I go with Houston as well. Same uh, here. Chicago, Columbus. This is actually a tough call. It this is. This is w- with the way both these teams are playing. This could end up being quite the rivalry. I agree. In the East Bas- Baxter uh, Schweinsteiger, of course, getting his goal in his <laughs> debut, which everybody said odds? he wouldn't do. But I think Columbus is playing so well right now. That's exactly I'm actually who I'm take sitting on. The crew. Yeah, I've been sitting on the crew as well too. I mean. This, this new transfer with Kikuchi Mane coming in as well, too. I want to see how he starts to assimilate into the team right now, but Columbus has just really been a surprise for me this season. This is the Columbus crew that people thought was going to be good last year, especially after how well they did you know, going to the MLS Cup two years ago. Now then they fell into the basement, now they're back again. And isn't it interesting that Columbus and Portland both make it to MLS Cup two years ago, then they don't make the playoffs last year, and now they're tied on Supporter Shield Shoo. points. Now they're both shooting back up again. Yeah. With arguably Columbus without their best player in Kai Kamara at the time, no longer on the roster. 
And they've been right, able to prove up, that they didn't need him. Which ended up being, yeah, a great move. Exactly. D.C. United, NYCFC, Philly, and Portland. Two fun games. Boy, D.C. is just looking horrible. Uh, they did win last week, though. They, that's right. They, they did, did get a 2-1 victory, but, but NYCFC also won last somebody week. Somebody's suspended, though, aren't they? Uh, Sarvas. Dis- yes. Sarvas yeah. is suspended. I'm going to take a draw on this one, honestly, because I don't know what to... I'm going to take New York City. Okay, okay. So you took last week, and I believe they they won their game uh, rather handily, so good for them. Philly, Portland. Listen, Philly, uh, same conversation like I have with the Revs. No one likes you. You have a lot to prove. Portland's going to run all over you, even if the game is in Philly. I like that call. Okay. There we go. That expert analysis. You heard it here (laughs) first on two up front. Uh, Moving forward, TFC Atlanta. That'll be a fun game. And then FC Dallas, Minnesota. Yeah, I, I'm still going to take Toronto in this game. Joseph Martinez still out for Atlanta United. That's a, a big loss for them. A lot of their goal scoring comes through him. Yeah. Um, Toronto still has Josie Altidore, of course, Michael Bradley, la la da 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 I'm going with Toronto in this one. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with you, honestly. I mean, Joseph Martinez plays a huge part for what Atlanta has been doing this season. Plus, Atlanta has to go on the road into Toronto. Atlanta, the warm climate team going into the bitter cold of Great TFC point. currently. I think TFC is going to ultimately control the possession, control the weather, and, and win the game at the end of the day. FC Dallas and Minnesota United, this is a flash in the pan, right? We're not going to be sitting here saying Minnesota United is going to win. And FC no, Dallas. I, think, I think FC Dallas is going to be – it's going to go one of two ways. FC Dallas is going to be so angry about giving up that goal 12 goals in against the 93rd United. minute that, yeah, they're going to come out angry and, and destroy Minnesota United. Or I don't think there's going to be any in between, Baxter. Or they're going to be so devastated and emotionally drained from that game against Pachuca that they come out completely flat and get destroyed by Minnesota. But I'm going to go with FC Dallas. I was going to say, Mike, but you're probably still sticking with FC Dallas, which is where I'm headed as well, too. Uh, Looking across here, RSL versus Vancouver, San Jose, Seattle. Now, this is kind of where you can maybe go back and forth. RSL and Vancouver have been a little all over the place recently. Do you put any stock in them, especially losing to Minnesota last week? Uh I think I actually put more stock in Vancouver's focus right now is Champions League ball. Yeah. Uh, the last time they played against Tigres, I talked about how they're going to come out tired, which is exactly what they did. They ended up losing that weekend. I actually think we see the same thing again, Baxter. Uh, Mike Pecky will be in charge of RSL, so they're going to have that boost of a new coach there, um, Real Salt Lake, of course. Point. So I'm going to go with our, uh, a rejuvenated RSL taking down a very tired Vancouver Whitecaps. All right. I'm going to go with the draw on this one, actually, just uh, from, to spice things up. Up a little bit here. San Jose, Seattle. San Jose has been decent recently, but Seattle also, of course, Clint Dempsey's been playing out of his mind recently. Um, it's a tough game for me to call, but I think Seattle ultimately steals this one. Okay, I'm going to take San Jose. There we go. Nice little, uh, nice little switcheroo there on this. There we go. Uh, then the last two, Orlando Red Bulls, SKC, uh, Colorado. What do you think? Well, if I, if I remember correctly, Orlando got their first loss they did. just last week. A shutout, I believe. Uh, New York Red Bulls seeming a bit uh, injured. Orlando's been looking good at home. I'm going to take Orlando City. That's who I was thinking of as well, too. And then you've got SKC Colorado. It's at SKC, I've got to take with the Blues on this one. Yeah, right there with you. Take All right. Let us know your predictions in the comments section below, of course. Uh, remember to get us on the social media universe as well. Simon, it's been a lot of fun. We've had a great show today. Uh, Good to hear from Steph Oaks and Rose Lavelle as well from the Houston Dynamo and the Boston Breakers and women's national team as well. Houston Dash, Baxter. Houston Dash. Houston Dash, Dash, your club. It's been such a long time that I had to say the name. I don't know. Uh, Do you got any final thoughts or anything for us before we jump off? Usually this is the part of the show where I come up with some crazy news I read about. You're like, back did you hear in (sighs) Finland? Yeah, I haven't. Uh, I've had had an awesome week with with bookings for my acting work. Yeah, congratulations. uh, Actually, this morning, which is why we couldn't go on this morning, I got to act with my daughter, Grace, who's in studio here. Um, So that that was awesome, and I just want to say how thankful I am for those kind of opportunities. Absolutely, they don't come up very often, so you've got to make the most of it. Absolutely, yep, yep. Well, phenomenal. Well, we appreciate all of you joining us. Remember, you can find us on our website, twoupfrontsoccer.com, of course, on brewsportsnet.com, and on Bruce Sports' Facebook page as well. Uh, traditionally on Wednesdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time, so make sure you check us out there. Hit that like button, tell your friends, that way you can all come watch us here on Bruce Sports on a consistent basis. And of course, you can get our show uh, on demand for audio listeners on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and on Spreaker.com as well. And yeah, check us out on Facebook ourselves at Two Up Front. Give that page a like as well. And hey, why not give it a share there too? And check us out on Twitter at Two Up Front Soccer. All right, Simon Crowe, I'm Baxter Coleman. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, with our manager being the one above, we are Two Up Front. <laughs>